Have you discovered more about the heart of our glorious God? Will you please open your Bible to Joshua chapter 10? <laughs> Grab a pen and a paper and please pray with me. Mighty God, you are holy, you are perfect. We are needful for everything you desire to show us. So reveal it to us now and write it on our hearts. In your name, precious Lord Jesus, amen. When I was a student at the University of Washington, I was an average student with above average energy. I'm not one to sit around, so in three years, I completed two undergraduate degrees. Three years spent between running classes to classes in the library, no time to enjoy campus life, no clubs, no sports. I went to one football game because my dad, he's an avid, avid college football fan, scooped me up and bought me licorice to entice me to go. <laughs> Looking back, I feel kind of sad. I'm sad for the friendships I missed, sad for the college life I didn't enjoy. You see, the university invited me to be more than just a degree seeker. They invited me to be a student, a student. It got me thinking. That's how some people view salvation, seeking the medal of salvation versus savoring the experience of walking toward the victory. Jesus invites us to his salvation. Jesus says, cast your life on me, and by God's grace, God's people believe. Rescued for eternity, hallelujah. And then they go back to the emptiness of life's daily grind, back to loneliness, back to secret sin, back to Groundhog Day to-dos, back to letting people down and letting myself down and even thinking we're letting God down. But then we open the Bible. And God, through the Bible, invites us to ask, is there more to Jesus' invitation of salvation? Does Jesus' invitation of salvation make a difference today, tomorrow, and through the rest of our lives and into eternity? And the Bible says a resounding yes. I didn't just say yes to being a university graduate. I said yes to being a college kid, but I missed out on all that employed implied and on a far grander scale i didn't just say yes to jesus and move on i said yes to jesus and his invitation of salvation and became a child of the most high god that should change my life a place at god's feet to learn god's heart a new door burst open open a new life in this life and we see this with Joshua and the Israelites. They are the chosen children of the Most High God. They are learning the fullness of what saying yes to God means. It's interesting, isn't it? Through their battles and war, God reveals the grand implications of a life aligned with God. Victory in life for the people of God happens by the power of God. Victory in life for the people of God happens by the power of God. So we are going to look at these sections, these Joshua, Joshua chapter 10. We're going to see a victorious life in God. And then Joshua chapters 11 through 12 are obedient living to God. So through God's promises and miracles, Israel finally, finally entered the promised land. And we saw two ways Israel approached battles in their life path. The Jericho walls fell as they obeyed God, and then the first AI battle went horribly sideways as they launched out on their own. <laughs> so it's noteworthy. These two events occupy more space in the Bible than seven years of bloody battles to fully conquer the rest of the Promised Land. I think this contrast is important because it teaches how greatly God values our obedience. Not simply salvation, I said yes to Jesus Christ as my Savior, but God longs for his people to live victoriously different on the new road he's given them. And God explains this victorious living happens through a life that is surrendered, obedient, and trusting God. In chapter 10, the Amorite kings see two things. They see Israelites' destruction of Jericho and Ai, and they see uh, 
Gibeon with great fighters aligned with Israel. So if you put yourself in their story, you see Israel and their God coming at you. And so these five Amorite kings decide to form a coalition, five against one, and they attack Gibeon. And Gibeon calls out to Joshua. Let's read verse, chapter 10, verse 7. <clears throat> It says, uh, so Joshua marched up with Gilgal and his entire army, including all the best fighting men. And the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid. I've given them into your hand. Not one of them will be able to withstand you. So Joshua is responding in the way he should. He hears a concern. He sees a need. He goes to God. <laughs> God gives victory in the battles. God calls us to fight. That is a truth you should hang your hat on. God gives victory in the battles he calls us to fight. Joshua uh, prays to God and God sees Joshua's heart. And though Joshua has intimately walked with God and seen God fulfill his promises, he, he a fear creeps in and, and that's natural. God sees Joshua's fear and he says, don't be afraid. Fear of the unknown, fear of what is far bigger than us. Fear is a Christian's trigger to think differently about our situation. How are you using fear in your life to look differently at the situations you're in? Fear rises not just when we think something is bigger than us, but when we think something is bigger than God. Fear is when we think something is bigger than God. And God says, look at me. Look up. Look up. I'm always with you. And remember me. Fear paralyzes, but faith energizes. That's a fun little thing to remember that fear paralyzes, but faith energizes. So we navigate this life at God's invitation differently. We embrace the fullness of our salvation and that means we think rightly about God and we act rightly in this life. We think right about God and we, we move as he asks us to do based on what his word says. So Israel marches all night uphill 15 kilometers and God threw the Amorites into confusion and they fled and God hurled hailstones and many Amorites were killed that day. God is the commander of the army. God gives miraculous victories and God keeps his promises. And a life saved by God means we can trust God in everything. Everything you face today, you can trust God. These Wondrous ways of God continue for all who are saved by the Lord. So let's look at chapter 10, verses 12 to 13. On the day the Lord gave the Amorites over to Israel, Joshua said to the Lord in the presence of Israel, O sun, stand still over Gibeon, O moon, over the valley of Ajalon. And so the sun stood still and the moon stopped till the nation avenged itself on its enemies. That's a pretty powerful moment in history, isn't it? God's ways are inconceivable. And yet this text shows us a life saved by God invites us to call out to God. And how we do that is a thing called prayer. Well, it's a spiritual term. What is your experience with prayer? Well, I rather suspect you know you should pray, but I wonder if you think it makes a difference. Well, let me ask, why pray? A relationship with God comes through time with God. Prayer is love, and love thrives through communication. Prayer opens the floodgates for God's peace and presence, renewal, and, and even the miraculous. And prayer opens your soul so more of God can come in. Prayer shapes the reality, and prayer influences your future. Scripture teaches a beautiful tension of God's sovereignty, and yet somehow our prayers shape the future. Prayer is this radical insistence. Your past does not have the last word. So if that's true, then isn't prayer one of the most life-giving, exhilarating things you and I can do? Your prayers directly impact your work, your marriage, your children, your ministry, your neighborhood, your church, your country. Prayer can reconstruct the brokenness of life. And prayer lets you dream what you never thought possible. Karl Barth says, prayer is the beginning of an uprising against the disorder of the world. So how do you pray? Well, prayer is the real you coming before a real God. And use simple words, pray from the heart, 
The gospel invites you to come with your scars and your brokenness, your messiness, because that's what Jesus came for, to redeem what was broken. And prayer cuts a channel for God's favor to flow. And prayer opens our eyes to God's favor already in our life. So we come to God, and when we do, we discover he's our strength, he's our answer, he's our hope. So these five kings, they are out running the Israelites and the hail and they escape into a cave and the Israelite army was chasing the Amorites. So Joshua said, seal up the cave with a rock. They destroy most of the Amorites except those who reach the fortified city and they return to the cave. And Joshua encouraged the Israelite army with the same words God had, had previously encouraged Joshua. Do you remember that? He says in verse 25, Do not be afraid. Do not be discouraged. Be strong and courageous. This is what the Lord will do to all the enemies you are going to fight. And then Joshua struck down and, and killed the kings. And then seals their bodies in a cave as a memorial of God's victory of God's promises coming to Israel. God gives victories in the battle. He calls us to fight. God didn't just save you and leave you. No, God rescued you. His salvation of you means he is with you. He's with you when your husband walks out, when your kids defy or deny you. Their choices have great consequences. God is with you when you feel targeted and bullied at work. He's with you when your parents and friends die. God hears your prayers. He cares and God has the power to act. His salvation of you means he has thrown open the doors of his spirit to guide you, his ears to hear you, and God's word to feed you. That's what his salvation of you does. And his salvation of you means you journey in this life with God. Don't just seek the degree of eternity. Live today in the fullness of your relationship with God. That's his invitation. Jesus died on the cross. Jesus won your victory. Jesus is renewing all things in this life today. Live it. Live it. We trust in who Jesus is and what he did on the cross. We trust what Jesus will do when he returns. Jesus' ultimate victory allows you to victoriously trust God with everything, every circumstance of your life today. Will you trust him? Will you trust him? In verses 28 to 43, city after city is destroyed in the southern kingdom. And then we get to verse 42 and it says, All these kings and their lands Joshua conquered in one campaign because the Lord, the God of Israel, fought for Israel. One campaign. They must have been exhausted, right? But God was victorious. Pulling this into a truth of God, we learn God's people mature as they share in his victories. God's people mature as, as you and I share in his victories. Are you on the battlefield for God? What spiritual battle is God asking you to fight? Is it materialism or selfishness or a love of status or a refusal to forgive? Are you battling a social media addiction or indifference to your colleagues or your neighbors or your children's salvation? God is magnified when his people of promise live into the promise and God's people mature when we live into the fullness of our salvation in Christ. So what benefits of being a child of the Most High God are you rejecting or dismissing? Will you let God show you? Will you have a tender heart? And will you pray, pray, pray to hear the heart of God? On to chapter 11 and obedient living to God. This northern campaign, which takes about 10 minutes to read in these two chapters, Joshua 11 and 12, actually lasts seven long bloody years as they try to ally with the northern kingdom, king's ally against Israel. So let's read verse 4. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army as numerous as the sand on the seashore. And all these kings forces and made camp together in the waters of Miram to fight against Israel. You can imagine they would have been fearful. In verse 6, the Lord said to Joshua, do not be afraid of them because by this time tomorrow I will hand them all over to Israel slain. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. 
So the enemy has superior battle equipment and it was going to be destroyed, but Israel didn't need their horses. They didn't need their chariots because Israel has God. So let's read verse 18. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long, long time. Wouldn't you agree? God trains the Israelites and you and me through a long life struggle. Sometimes seven years is how long we need to deal with something. But God's power allows you and the seven billion people on earth to breathe every day, let alone go out and fight long battles with unbelief, with evangelism, with parenting, with alcoholism and depression, with ruined relationships, with consequences of disobeying the law. If you constantly reminded yourself of God's victory, it's certain in any situation you face today, and the situation you faced every day for the past 10 years, how would you approach it differently? How would you wake up differently looking at that battle? Just because you've been battling it for 10 years doesn't mean you're not being obedient. It doesn't mean you are losing the battle. It doesn't mean you're in the wrong battle. It means God is developing your trust in him through endurance training. Hebrews chapter 10 verse 36 says, you need endurance. So after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. So how is God expanding his kingdom through the way you navigate tough circumstances today? Let me also say right belief moves us to fight the right battles. So are you battling something you've chosen to battle? Or are you in the fight God has called you to? And there's a difference. Will you ask God? Will you pray? Often I encounter injustice at my job and my heart races and my mind races and I try to figure out how to address it. But this lesson is slowing me down to ask God, is this a battle you have called me into? It is through this seeking of God for his response, God grows our faith. And that's endurance training. I like to run marathons and I like to run long, long, long races. And, and so this is marathon thinking. Faith is a gift from God and a muscle to be exercised. And our faith needs grounding. Faith needs grounding in God's word, the truth of who he is and his untraceable ways. And faith needs fuel, and that's God's word, God's Holy Spirit. They are the fuel to mature our faith. And, and faith needs to be exercised, and that's obedience, obedience to God's word. Obedience is, is how we win the battles in the power of God. If obedience believes God, and, and because I trust him, we obey him. So being saved by Christ opens the doors to relationship with God and communication with God and this powerful thing called prayer and understanding God through his word and obeying God through the power of the spirit. And if all that wasn't enough, God gave us the body of Christ you and me, your church family. God gave Joshua an army and God gives you an army of faith in your church and within your believing friends. We don't fight alone. Faith flourishes in community. God invites us to seek his daily strategy for daily victories. And when we believe God holds the method and the results, then we look to him for how to live out our faith each day. When we don't believe, though, God uses our situations for his glory. We don't believe that his, our training is purposeful. We rely on what worked yesterday and then resent God when he doesn't do what we want today. Now, we'll spend a few minutes on verse 20. It's something we need to wrestle with because it's, it's hard as we think about God's heart uh, being causing others to be hardened. It says, verse 20, For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts to wage war against Israel, so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy, as the Lord had commanded Moses. So, thinking of God hardening hearts, that is a, a hard thing when this God we adore above everything else, a God who is infinitely merciful and compassionate and and, and gracious, and then purposefully hardens their hearts and exterminates them without mercy. 
And an easy response would be to say, God is mean and, and God is inconsistent and what do we have need for God? Because that's no different than how people treat us, right? But here's another thought. We can thoughtfully and prayerfully examine the context and the conclusions of these chapters. The context is 400 years earlier, God had told Abraham, I'm not giving you the land now because the Amorite sin is not great enough. And over the past 400 years, the Amorite sin has become increasingly horrific with child sacrifice and bestiality and sexual immorality and incest and women getting pregnant so they could burn their baby to a made up God. You see, they are not innocent. They are pure evil. And for 400 years, God has watched this evil and now he says, justice must be done enough. And sometimes judgment on a few becomes warning of coming judgment on all. So God called Israel to, to bring a savior to the world and to, to bring final victory over all evil. That's what he used these, these chosen people to do. And God the Father and Jesus are one. They are unchanging. Our God is always just and always merciful. And if we seek God's vantage point, we'll find his perfect justice and mercy are always in balance. And of course, the hard truth is our sins deserve the same punishment. Our sin deserves death. And we want it that way, don't we? Because we don't want to give life to sin. We don't want the haunting effects of sin in eternity. And so by faith, we look to God revealed through the entire Bible. And we see God's goodness and God's mercy and God's justice affirmed by Jesus Christ as he died on the cross. The wrath we deserve was fully poured on to Jesus on the cross. And our salvation in Jesus Christ means we live today not trapped in guilt, but wondering at grace. Not trapped in guilt, but wondering at grace. And our salvation in Jesus Christ means, as verse 23 says, there will be times of rest from the war. There will be times of rest from the war, even in this life certainly forever into eternity. So will you live in the fullness of your salvation? Maybe you're going to be weary from the battle well fought, but will you wonder at his grace? In chapter 12, it reminds Israel and us God's victories are so worthy of remembering. Remembering victories reminds us of God's faithfulness. So we get a, a second truth here that faith grounded in God's word matures us through obedience. Faith grounded in God's word matures through obedience. Our responsibility is to know and adhere to God's word. God is able and free to do the impossible whenever and however he chooses. He is the creator of the universe. And when we trust this, we have victory. So here's what I pray you believe. Victory in life for the people of God happens by the power of God. Victory in life for the people of God happens by the power of God. Will you please pray with me? Lord God, as we think about the highs and lows of the life that we have been called to live, we know how desperate we are to trust you and to trust that you are going to mature us through them. We thank you for this gift of prayer, the opportunity to um, communicate with you, to, to pour out our love for you, to worship you, but then in your amazing way to also be on mission with you. So we ask for our hearts to, to be open to the way you are leading. We ask for our, our prayers to be aligned with the direction that you are charting the world. So it's in your magnificent we pray, name we pray, Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. God bless you.